We collect a lot of data from multiple sources. All your phones right now, everything that you do, your registration for this event, that's all data. We've collected it, we are using it for one thing or the other. And obviously, I hope, you know there are terms and conditions. Did you read anything? <laughs> yeah? Everywhere you go, you enter this building, your names are taken down even on a book. That's your data being collected, yeah? So I hope you guys know what your data has been used for. And I hope you know that your data has been collected in every now and then. Your devices are very good at doing that anyway. So this is the age that we're in. Um, and we can use this data for good. We can use it to drive economic growth. And we can use it for empowering and providing uh, services to our farmers. In everything that we do, we are supporting our farmers, and that's the key uh, for our program. Of course, despite the growing role of data, um, we have challenges. Of course, we need to be sure, and we have to make sure that the data has been used in a trustworthy manner, and we have to uh, consider the privacy of the people who are giving us their data. In this case, uh, our farmers. In fact, yesterday I was having a conversation with someone from Bayer, and he asked, do our farmers really know that we are collecting their data? Do they understand what we are doing with their data? Uh, we have partners here who we've uh, worked with them. Um, some of them didn't even know that they had this data and how valuable it was. And having those conversations has opened their eyes, uh, and they've been able now to uh, collect insights. But there's also, you know, data policies. There's uh, 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 data security and protection. I think some of our partners who are here will talk about it. Uh, and we have uh, key speakers who will also talk about what they've done. Uh, as Agrifin, we've um, worked over the past two years uh, to come up with a, a data tool, or a data readiness tool. And the reason for this is to help uh, the organizations that we work with um, to figure out their data, understand whether they have data and what it is used for, how they can use it to build insights. Um, and that way we are able to provide uh, products and services that will uh, uh, support our farmers. Right now, we have, um, besides the data, the data sharing tool, we have uh, a process that we uh, help our partners or we guide our partners to think about data sharing. So one way is to uh, catalog internal data. That, uh, sorry. Our data readiness tool helps you to catalog and even figure out whether you have data. Yeah. Once you have the data, what do you want to use the data for? And so you're going to analyze it and uh, uh, know what your data, uh, what your data is, uh, the cost, uh, uh, cost benefit analysis, and identify data gaps based on what you want to use it for. You have to get leadership buy-in. Of course, if your leadership does not understand or even doesn't know whether you have that data, and but for them to even give you their go-ahead to even analyze that data. Um, we've had cases where we've had institutions uh, where uh, departments want to share data amongst each other. One case was in Ethiopia, another in Rwanda, um, and one here in Kenya. You have a social enterprise uh, within our own innovation uh, division within the, uh, the mother company, they want to, uh, they have developed products that are ta tailored to support farmers, provide financial services, uh, uh, learning content, and so many other uh, different uh, services. However, they need data for more insight, and the mother company has that data. However, there are constraints. The mother company does not understand why the innovation department wants that data, and this is within the same, let's say, organization. 
Of course, the use case for uh, the data when it was being collected in the first place was just for you know, specific things. And now, the new department wants to use it for something else, or the new social enterprise wants to use it for something else. There are things like consent. Now you have to go back to the farmers, you have to go back to your customers and ask for consent for reuse of their, of their content, of their data. So you need to, buy, to get buy-in from your leadership. Now when it comes to data sharing, you need to identify your partners and identify a data partner. I think uh, Digital Green, Beza, will talk about uh, Farmstack. And then once you agree, once you have a, a, partner, a, a data partner, you negotiate, agree. Both of you have to agree. You have to have put everything on the table, and each one of you has to uh, say how they're going to benefit from each other. Then optimize and share data. So in this session, we'll have examples from multiple organizations from, uh, from different perspectives and the efforts that they've taken to collect and share data. They will share their learnings and encourage the participants uh, to actively engage and explore benefits of data sharing. With that, I'd like to welcome our uh, speakers. So just a bit of our portfolio. So we have a fairly large portfolio of investments. And uh, for those who don't know, the, the World Bank exclusively works with the government. We have four projects in Kenya. Uh, the first one is called the National Agriculture Rural Inclusive Growth Project. Uh, this covers 21 counties. Uh, it's a $200 million investment. The second one is called the Kenya Climate Smart Agriculture Project. That's a $250 million investment, covers 24 counties. So between Narig and KSAP, uh, we cover all 45 rural counties in Kenya. Uh, the KSAP uh, investment is more focused on the Asal regions and uh, specifically the Northeast, whereas Narig is really your Mount Kenya, Rift Valley, and Western Kenya, whereas KSAP is mostly Northeast and the Asal. So that's the distinction. Uh, then when the locust uh, kind of thing happened, and of course in response to the severe drought that, uh, that is there right now in Kenya, we have the emergency locust response program. This is in the 15 most drought impacted counties in Kenya, uh, $78 million investment. Uh, it's, it's an emergency investment being rolled out over the next two to three years. Then we have uh, the National Agriculture Value Chain Development Project, which has just been approved. Uh, this is really going to focus on uh, growth and commercialization uh, in Kenya, focusing on uh, smallholders, but those who are transiting to become commercial farmers. So as you can see, we have a fairly large footprint, $780 million covering all 45 uh, rural counties in Kenya. We work exclusively with the Ministry of Agriculture, both at the county level and at the national level. As you know, agriculture is a devolved subject in Kenya, so our engagement at the county level is very, very intensive. Uh, and we work very, very closely with CALRO, the Kenya Agriculture Livestock Research Organization. So what have we achieved so far? If you look at Narig and Kesa, because these projects have been going on for the last three years. So we have 1.2 million farmers, which have been mobilized uh, to approximately 50,000 farmer groups of 15 to 25 farmers each, and nearly 500 farmer producer organizations. I know the nomenclature here in Kenya is farmer cooperatives, uh, but uh, in the bank we use the word farmer producer organizations because in other countries, typically FPOs are also registered under the Companies Act. So that's why we use FPOs and not cooperatives, but the Kenyan context, these are 500 farmer cooperatives. Uh, in addition, in every ward that we intervene, uh, as you know in Kenya, you have the county, sub-county, ward. So at every ward, there's a community institution called the Community Driven Development Committee, which has been established. Uh, they are now being transformed to being SACOs, so that uh, farmers, these 1.2 million farmers, have access to uh, savings and credit. In most of these 50,000 farmer groups, we are developing what is called the lead farmers, so the best practicing farmers who is volunteering to provide 
really extension support in that group. Uh, in the next two years, we'll be at 50,000 lead farmers, but right now we are 25,000 lead farmers. And we've invested heavily in Calro uh, over the last three, four years to develop climate smart technologies. So Calro, through a process of adaptive research, applied research, has developed nearly 900 climate smart technologies just in the last three years, and Irene, I'm sure, will talk about it. And all of these have been digitized. So just to summarize, I think model is, we, because we are working with smallholders, important to mobilize them and federate them at two levels, farmer cooperatives so that they have access to inputs and markets, and SACOs so that we have access to, the farmers have access to savings and, uh, uh, and credit, and really strengthening a community-based extension approach where you're uh, building the capacity of communities to really provide extension services and strengthening the research extension linkage. So that's what we do. Now, uh, specifically in terms of uh, what have we done in terms of investment uh, on the data side. So under KSAP, we have a very, uh, we have a he very heavy $10 million investment in building the big data platform. And so that, that investment really enabled Caldo to really procure all the hardware and really set up the entire framework to build a big data platform. And Irene is going to talk more about it, so I, I won't steal her thunder. But that's the first big investment that, that we made. We've also been supporting Calro to, because we know that uh, human resources, people having the technical capacity to work on data-related issues are critical. So we are investing a lot on uh, helping Calro recruit human resources of uh, that capacity. Uh, we also have uh, provided additional resources Calro to Calro to uh, really kind of collect uh, a, a registry of farmers across Kenya, and I'll talk about it. So we have 2.37 million farmers, uh, which are right now uh, registered on the big data platform. Uh, Importantly, because we look at the big data platform as a platform to provide agro-weather advisories, we realize that while, yes, agro-weather advisory, I mean, the, the, the weather updates can be procured and obtained from the satellite, but also we've invested heavily in improving the ground-level data as far as, uh, uh, you know, data related to uh, weather forecasting is concerned. So the World Bank project has invested in 154 new automatic weather stations being set up across all 45 rural counties in Kenya. And that's far more accurate data coming in from the ground and uh, being tapped into by the big data platform. So as we speak, the big data platform is able to tap into both satellite weather data and data from uh, much more accurate data uh, all this equipment is from Europe, and so this is state of the art. So more accurate data is coming in. So these 2.37 million farmers, which are registered on the big data platform, are getting uh, fortnightly agro weather advisories. In addition, there are 235 physical markets across Kenya where you have crop and livestock commodities being traded, bought, sold, bought. So. The World Bank's KSAP project has invested on collecting data from each one of these 235 physical markets across Kenya. And that data is also being punched into the big data platform. So the big data platform is providing agro-weather advisories and market advisories coming in from these 235 uh, uh, you know, physical markets. And so the, all this investment has happened through uh, KSAP. Uh, because we realized that uh, every farmer will not have a smartphone, we helped Calro set up a call center, and again, Irene, I'm sure, will talk about it, because we realized that you need to have multiple pathways to allow farmers to access this information regarding agro-weather and market advisories. So this is the dashboard. Uh, uh, this is from a few days back. Uh, you can see that there are 2.37 million farmers. This is all 47 counties. Uh, and uh, I'm sure Irene will talk about more about it, but data is uh, being collected from a multiple kind of phase, and you have uh, a value chain cut to it, uh, a county cut to it. Uh, so as I mentioned, the key benefits is that each of these 2.35 million farmers 
uh, have access to agro weather advisories, market advisories, the good agriculture practices, the 290 TIMS which have been developed have all been digitized. Farmers, either through the call center, through an app, uh, can actually uh, get access to these good agriculture practices, uh, which are very value chain specific. So this is the public good kind of, and farmers ha are not paying for it. This is really the public good investment that has happened on agriculture data over the last three, four years uh, within the government, thanks to the bank's investment uh, under uh, the projects which I've just explained. Uh, so that's where we are. This is just uh, a pictorial representation of the Kenya Agriculture Observatory platform. This is what I was talking about. Your, uh, we, uh, you know, through KL, uh, Caldo is able to tap into both weather data and, of course, uh, the, the ground data. And I mentioned how the bank has invested on improving the quality of ground data that is coming in. Thank you, and uh, I think uh, I just want to leave the, uh, conclude the presentation by saying that uh, the way Emmanuel started. So I think it's good that Kenya has been a big uh, mover in terms of uh, where we are in M-Pesa. So the trust with even a smallholder being able to use the mobile is there. But I think what is the next level that all of us need to aspire is the usability of the data that is coming in. Yes, there's a lot of agro weather advisories. There's a lot of uh, 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 you know, uh, climate advisories, market advisories. And I have personally gone to every nook and corner of Kenya. I think now, how do farmers then use that data for decision making in terms of planting, in terms of selling their uh, crops, in terms of which seeds? That conversion, which is, is data being converted to usability, is a question all of us need to think about. Thank you so much. I'm happy to see so many people interested in data sharing, and especially our Kenyan counterparts. Uh, the room, I think, is at least 40%, 50% Kenyan. I also recognize our team from Ethiopia. Uh, <laughs> there, are, I think uh, you have now 30% participants from the team from Ethiopia uh, who are also in this room on data sharing. How much data do we actually need? We were asked to answer that question. And uh, what are the costs and the resources required to gather data? Uh, a few figures have been presented on the costs. But I can assure you, don't be scared of those figures. V Vinay will not come to you unless you have something to show, okay? So before you get those figures right, uh, you have to have something to show. Uh, of course, I'll talk about the policies in place and the data ecosystem and the standards. I'll talk, I'll highlight on the successful data collection that is the National Farmer Database. And I'll also demonstrate uh, a few... Uh, how how Caro is a public sector, how we share and what we have what we how what we have learned from the from working in this ecosystem. Okay, Caro Data Hub or our big data platform. Uh, the Data Hub plays as a key role as a, the central facilitator for access, sharing, and utilization of data, data products, data services across the agricultural ecosystem. So what, what, is, our, what is our take? Uh, we have four principles, or what are our objectives? We have four principles. Uh, one of our principles is to aggregate and manage data. Our second principle is to promote data sharing and usage. I have talked in very many forums. Caro has talked in very many forums about data sharing. Uh, we also inspire innovation and action. Uh, we are interested using our big data platform to improve uh, capacity and practices among various stakeholders. On the question, how much data do we actually need? And the cost and resources required to gather data. 
I'm going to attempt to answer those questions with uh, three slides, one on policy, one on data stewardship, and uh, of course the figures, as I said earlier, they were projected, but we should not fear those figures. Uh, one thing as startups uh, in this room, uh, we need a data policy. So one thing that Carol did or did put in place was data policy. And uh, our policy is that collection of research data for utilization and impact. That is our mission. Every data we collect must be utilized and it has to create impact to the stakeholders, be they policy or be they farmers. Today we are going to talk a lot about the farmers. Um, on these policies that we are collecting, um, how do we go about it? So num our number A, we do data collection or we collect research data. We have a lot of research data uh, in all our 16 institutes. Uh, we have a policy on the retention of that research data. We have a policy on access of research data. Uh, we have created or we have written very many MOUs with our partners. Every partner who comes to Carol, the first thing we do is quickly put on board them by having a data sharing agreement or we do an MOU with the organization. Um, we do data for, for from data for, we have a policy for data from collaborative research. Uh, our earlier presenter said we have developed 19 uh, value chains or 19 teams. Um, those teams are not developed by CARO alone. So that is collaborative research from the universities and the others. So we do have policy on that. Uh, we have policy on collection of data or what is restricted data and how we handle that data. And we also have a policy on dissemination and publication of data, data products and services. Basically, what are the outputs from research? Uh, teams, uh, we are here and we understand the data ecosystem and the standards. But there are, few, there are few things or there are a few steps that I would like to highlight. We must recognize that this data ecosystem has very many players. There are also very many processes, there are technologies, and while you are inside that space, and before we go to the bank, before we go to Masikop, before we go everywhere else, we, are fa we first must recognize what we have as an organization. And what is, what do we own? What is ours? You get, what does, what is accessible to the public? And uh, we, of course, recognize the knowledge that CARO as an organization is creating and uh, what it is mandated by this government to do, and the quality, we are very concerned about quality and security. I would be happy if Emmanuel will share with the participants these slides. Um, on my last slide, on trying to answer the question on how much data do we need, or how much or does it cost? Uh, I want to tell you that one of our success factors has been turning data into a service. You can have very little data, you can have big data. Uh, but the most important thing is to turn data into services. Uh, I do encourage the teams who are here, uh, let's, let's take advantage of the data we have regardless of whether it is big or small. Uh, I do encourage that the hackathons should come back. I think we will talk to Vinay and uh, try to have more hackathons where we can bring these startups and expose them to this data. And uh, we see what innovations they come up with. We held a few as we were starting and uh, they, that time we didn't have as much data as we even have right now. 
moving forward, I'm going to talk about one of the success, successful stories that we have, uh, the, the National Farmer Database. On our National Farmer Database, we register the name of the farmer, we do register the county he's coming from, we have the sub-county, the ward, and the, and the village. We are happy to announce to this team that we have over 2.3 million georeferenced farmers receiving agro, weather, and market advisories from 47 counties. So we are covering the full country and they are with agro, weather, and market advisories. Um, these advisories are not done by just one team. I want to recognize the help from KSAP. I want to recognize the help from KMD uh, and the Ministry of Agriculture, who are also housing the KAMIS platform. The KAMIS platform was presented a few minutes ago. Uh, we collect data from five markets in, the, in each county, five major markets in each county, and that data flows into our big data platform. Our markets in each county, I think, operate two days per, per, uh, per week. So that data is flowing, and we are disseminating that to our 2.3 digitized farmers. I also want to talk about data visualization. It is important that whatever data we are receiving, we are able to visualize it for our stakeholders. So that is our dashboard. That is the National Farmer Dashboard. It is available to the public. Uh, you can query. You can query how many startups are in your county. You can query how many startups are in your ward. Uh, you can query the, the number of farmers receiving agro advisories. And uh, you can even go as far as querying uh, the, the number of words that are represented using this farmer dashboard. So what are the lessons that we have learned or the key lessons we have learned from implementing the big data? One thing you have on this journey, you have to uh, have a strategy, a digital strategy. Uh, you're not going to attract any partner without a strategy. Uh, secondly, you have to turn agricultural data into a service. Uh, data as a public good to promote data sharing and usage. Uh, you also have to inspire innovation. Um, Agricultural intelligence, uh, we are at the forefront. Uh, we are also doing a lot of capacity building. Uh, we appreciate the funds or the efforts from our development partners. And there is collaboration and financial sustainable models. You have to develop collaboration and also sustainable models. And um, I want you to just peep a little bit on the areas that we have visited. Uh, we have done sensitization of pastoralists and farmers on digital technologies. Uh, these are success stories. The people you see there, they are not just pictures. These are people who are laughing all the way to the bank. And why are they laughing? They are laughing because of the teams or the technology innovation practices management practices that they have received. I'm happy to announce that that is Wamboi who is there. Wamboi is works in an aggravate in, in Nakuru. Her story has been covered by even BBC. Uh, she sells her commodities, but she uses the cow-op. She advises the farmers. It is, it is now time to go and do top dressing. I have a nap. And the farmers trust her, and the, she is actually laughing all the way to the bank. Lastly, of course, there is the government, uh, government policy on data protection, or the Data Protection Act. As an organization, we have embraced the policy. 
uh, we are happy that the policy exists. We do want to even go further and uh, and say and. Uh, and ask the organizations, how much data do we need? Uh, when I walk into this building, how much of my data should they collect? But for me, I am obeying the policy. I am collecting the data, only the data that I need to change the lives of the farmers. Asante sana. So I will be uh, talking a little ab about uh, uh, what we have done in data sharing uh, at Digital Green uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, so just uh, for those of you who doesn't know uh, Digital Green, Digital Green is an international uh, non-for-profit -for uh, uh, organization. We have implementation in uh, India, Ethiopia, and uh, Kenya, and Nigeria also. So our mission is creating a world where farmers use technology and data to build a prosperous community. Uh, so uh, our main vendors are uh, BMJF, uh, also FCDO, and others. So we work uh, with wherever we go, be it in India or uh, Ethiopia or also Kenya, we closely work with the government. Uh, in Ethiopia, we work with the Ministry of Agriculture and the Agricultural Transformation Institute. So we try not to create a parallel uh, structure, rather leverage whatever structure that is available on the ground to disseminate uh, agricultural advisories. So our uh, major flagship product uh, is uh, the digitizing the extension uh, system, which is the video enabled extension. But for today, I will be focusing on what we are doing in uh, data sharing uh, and facilitating data sharing among uh, various stakeholders in the agricultural ecosystem. So, uh, as you all know, uh, agriculture generates a lot of data. So each of organization that is here today is also uh, involved in generating a lot of agricultural data, be it at the government level or in each level of uh, the ecosystem. And also we are a heavily consumed uh, data uh, to support uh, the smallholder farmers. So we at the beginning of uh, this project we tried to talk to uh, or various organizations uh, in ethiopia and understand what kind of data is available within the ecosystem and also if they are willing to share uh, data so these are like the major three uh, challenges that was raised by most of the organization so whenever we ask if they are willing to share data to another organization, three are the, the major ones. So some said they have issue of trust, so they don't know uh, whether th the data that they are sharing will be used for their intended purpose. Other uh, mentioned the issue of security and how, how, th how can they ensure like various policies in uh, data sharing. The end is most doesn't know which data is exist in which organization also. So there is an issue of like discovery. So for example, uh, organization doesn't have an idea like what kind of data is available within ATI or Ministry of Agriculture. So those kinds of issues are like some of the challenges that uh, we try to uh, uh, also address. So when we uh, talk about like data sharing problems, uh, in different levels, uh, we have uh, issues, right? So when you, when you talk about the, at the system level, we have a very fragmented systems uh, by different organizations and uh, organization doesn't have the policy or the trust to share data. At the farmer level, uh, of course they share data, but they, they, they don't have the control over what data they are uh, currently sharing. So the product that uh, currently we are implementing at Digital Green is FarmStack. So what FarmStack is, uh, an open source uh, protocol which powers uh, secure uh, data transfer among uh, stakeholders in the agriculture sector. So what we mean by that is, these are like the three major functionality of FarmStack. 
So uh, there are like various ways of like sharing data, right? One would be to share your data in a central uh, data hub, which makes sense, especially earlier, Carlo is also uh, sharing their experience in developing data hub and sharing it to the internally also to the outside. So the other would be like, how can we also share among different participants or uh, among different partners? So there are like some data that is like public, but at the same time there are data uh, that needs to be shared based on policy and that needs uh, some level of like security. So what Firmstack will uh, have enabled uh, in this data sharing is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, data uh, sharing. So uh, would have, uh, I will discuss about the ecosystem, but any organization who's part of the uh, ecosystem and is willing to share data, they are not obliged to uh, give uh, hand over their data to a central database, rather they will have control over their data and they will be able to share their data to uh, uh, directly to uh, another partner which is in the network rather than giving their uh, data to the central database. The, the, the second is uh, usage policy. So whenever uh, that organization shares data, they can be able to like set the different kinds of usage policy that needs to be applied when uh, the data is used. So the, 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 third, the third would be uh, data discoverability. Uh, so in the ecosystem, uh, there are like different actors. Uh, so, uh, the, the, the main would be the steward, right? So for different organizations to be able to trust and share data among themselves, there needs to be like steward organization that can be a public uh, institute or research institute for Ethiopia case. Uh, it is currently stewarded by the Agricultural Transformation Institute and we are working with Carlo here in uh, Kenya to be able to have that role, right? So different organizations want to share data, but who will be the central entity who help them to like enforce these policies? Also uh, be like a, an independent kind of organization where uh, the, this like stewardship role can be hosted. So the second would be the participants, potentially any private sector, public sector, or NGO who are like actively engaged in generating uh, data in the sector can also be the part of uh, this ecosystem. So one, there will be like different levels. The first level will be like to share their metadata so that like their data can be discoverable by the other participant. The second will be like by identifying specific use cases that they can be able, depending on the use cases, directly share the data to the consumer uh, participant in the network. So through, through, through this like uh, network, the ultimate goal would be uh, to create uh, uh, control for farmers, might not be at, at individual level, but farmer groups to be able to have that control or give consent on their data whenever they share. So, uh, I tried to mention some of them. So uh, our like greatest ally uh, ally alliance in Ethiopia is the Agricultural Transformation Institute. They have already uh, taken the role of uh, stewardship and they have started uh, onboarding various uh, participant organizations in the ecosystem. And also they have uh, done a very good job in having this data hub at the uh, ATI and also share the uh, catalog data or the metadata that they have. So uh, in Kenya, we are uh, working with the Ministry of the Carlo to establish uh, this work. In, in India, we have implemented various use cases which shows the uh, value of uh, these kinds of data sharing. So just to highlight how th this work, uh, we have the concept of connectors. So uh, each organization will be part of this uh, ecosystem and uh, each organization will establish a connector for the data they uh, publish in this uh, platform. Then those connectors would be where uh, there is a safe place for those use cases to happen uh, and also uh, share. So just some screenshots. This is from the uh, 
uh, ATI uh, live website. So uh, currently they have uh, uh, onboarded few organizations. So we are in the process of also uh, talking to many organizations and publish publicizing this so that they can be able to join this network. So hopefully it will be also available for the Kenyan uh, friends colleagues. Uh, so data catalog will be shown for each organization and their metadata can be uh, shared. So we can think of like multiple use cases. Uh, uh, we are now trying a couple of use cases with ATI and also the CIAT team. So uh, one would be in uh, ATI have this big platform where they collect uh, the I, through IVR uh, system, collect individual farmer phone numbers, but how can they leverage uh, to use that by also uh, getting location information from other potential uh, uh, data sets in the ecosystem is something that we are trying with them. Also working with the SEAT team, uh, so the SEAT team, for example, have uh, an agriculture uh, fertilizer recommendation with a specific location, but how that can be also uh, joined with uh, other organizations who have a geographic location of the individual farmer, so that that advisory of uh, fertilizer can be directly sent out to the uh, individual farmers. So that's it, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'll just start with a quick question. Uh, so, uh, you know, as agriculture research organization or, you know, someone who is interested in agriculture, one of the fundamental questions we asked, what is grown where, right? So, and how much amount? Now, my qu question to all of you is, uh, can you definitely say, let's say, take a, take a crop, beans, right? Where is beans grown in Kenya at an individual parcel level? Do we have that information? We have heard about, you know, a lot of, Technologies, a lot of attempts being done. Do can we answer that question? Or even you know, we all agree fertilizer is really important. Do we know how much fertilizer farmers are uh, putting on their uh, farm, right? Like at an individual level, we don't know that. So what do we do when that kind of uh, question arises? We do survey. We do a lot of survey. We spend a lot of money in surveys, and when we try to do that, it also delays you know the program implementation. We often don't look into what is available out there. And these are just some of the backgrounds I want to mention uh, to come to uh, describe what we are doing in CGIR to make this uh, process much more uh, you know, efficient. Uh, and to do survey, what do we do? We create another app. We use another app. Uh, this is one of my favorite app in Google Play Store. You should check it out. This is uh, developed by one of our colleagues. It's called yet another agriculture app. Uh, they stopped uh, updating it after 2016 or 17 because they were just troubled, like, you know, like they were confused. And we are sufficiently tech-savvy people, right? Now think about the farmer. The farmers can get app for everything. They, get, can, they can get an app for beans. They can get an app for maize. They can get an app for when to plant maize and when to uh, you know, uh, top dress maze, when to uh, sell the maze, right? So there is a lot of apps. We are flooding, uh, you know, on apps. So why is, why is that problem? Uh, how can we address that uh, kind of situation? So this is our principle. This is, this is coming from uh, the CGIR, uh, you know, uh, a big data platform, uh, and where we have tried to uh, create this infrastructure and tools. Uh, we have heard about data collection, but also there was, it was emphasized that Without the tools to analyze the data, uh, it, it means nothing, right? We cannot just take in the weather data and say the farmers that it is going to rain 200 millimeter to your farm next week, right? We have to say what you need to do and what does 200 millimeter mean for you, right? Whether uh, it is a sandy soil, whether it is a loamy soil, whether you are cropping maize, whether you are cropping, you know, sorghum, what are the what are what, what is uh, going to happen? Uh, what should be the action from the farmer side that we need to emphasize? So what what the, what is fear? We talked about uh, data not being uh, uh, you know uh, findable. We don't know where the fertilizer responses data is, where the you know crop uh, ground truth data is. So data should be findable, right? We should know who contains what kind of data. Uh, what is uh, uh, a accessible? Like okay, I can say I have all the data, but I don't want to give give that out. Right, so data should be accessible. Now, F and A they uh, constitute the you know open data part, but then there are two important principles, uh, I, which is interoperable. That's why we have so many apps because the apps don't speak with each other. FarmStack is one of the great examples where you know they are trying to 
uh, you know, make it, they're trying to make the data interoperable. Last is reusable. What happens to all these millions of data we have collected so far? You know, like CGIR from the last 50 years have collected millions of millions of data. Every year we go out to field, we collect data. If we don't make sure that the data are reusable, there is no use of that. You know, we can't go on to field and collect data every time. So to support this uh, fairification process, we call it a fairification process, each data will have a fair score. Uh, we have uh, developed this platform, uh, which is the Guardian platform, uh, CGIR Guardian platform. Uh, any data set that has been uh, uh, developed by CGIR and has been published through any of the uh, you know, repositories, Dataverse or CCAN, um, they are available here. What does it contain? More than 200,000, um, uh, sorry, it's not only data, it's also publications. So more than 200,000 uh, publications and data. Uh, there is uh, 12 terabyte of storage, uh, 12 terabyte of data that we are serving from there right now. Uh, and then this is just the primary data we are talking about. You can synthesize on it and you can you know, create more data. Now, what the Guardian ecosystem looks like, uh, you know, this is the back end. So we connect it with different uh, data sources. Each data sources should we make sure that they have some sort of licensing term so that we can extract the licensing, we can extract the metadata. It's very important because we need to know where was the data collected. Is the data coming with any licensing? Like, is, is, is it sensitive? You know, so we need to uh, address those, those issues. Now, once we have the data, if you move towards the right, uh, we need to know, you know, how to process the data set. So that, that's uh, you know, some of the infrastructure that we have been developing. And uh, there are technologies uh, and uh, you know, algorithms that we are developing. And I'm uh, you know, very happy that uh, Calro is part of that. You know, like we are working with the ICT team from Calro to help improve their crop selector platform. Like we have been working uh, with them how this infrastructure, you know, part of the analysis infrastructure can be plugged in there. Now, so this is basically, you know, basically finding data, you know, uh, accessing the data. Now, the, the approach could be also different. We can try to make sure the data is collected in a way that it is fair from the day one, right? So you, we can have infrastructure that collects data when it is creating the questionnaire, or when it is collecting the tools, it is making sure that we are using the standard ontology. Everywhere we are collecting the data, we are making sure like when we are collecting production data, it is collected production is collected, let's say, at kilogram per hectare, right? We make sure it is always kilogram per hectare. It is not a, uh, you know, sack, measurement of a sack, like how many, you know, maize did you produce? Oh, 10 sacks. Or it is not a measurement of a Provox, right? You know, Provox is the most popular medium in Kenya, and I've heard that if you ask farmer how many onions, do, onions did you produce, they say that, oh, two Provox, right? So we have to make sure that we avoid those kind of situation. So, I encourage you to go to AgriFIMS. Uh, this is one of the uh, new uh, survey, uh, you know, uh, data uh, collection supporting platform that we are developing. Now, uh, so this is this is and this is mostly focused towards collecting uh, field level information. You have ACT trials. You want to design your ACT trials. You can use this kind of platform. Now, what about household data collection? Um, we have uh, something developed by our colleagues uh, from ILRI and several other organizations called ROMIS, Rural Household Multiplicative Indicator Survey, right? So uh, they have standard set of indicators which they have developed based on, you know, analyzing DHS, LSMS, and all those large scale surveys and try to come up with the minimum set of indicator that you need to address critical, critical questions such as, you know, food, secu in food security or nutrition security. And uh, they are uh, now have completed you know, 45,000 uh, surveys, and all of those surveys are publicly available uh, through Data First. Uh, you know, it takes a bit of time to come up. You know, if you want to read the paper about behind the Robis, you know, uh, how it works, and the first uh, batch of data set that was published, uh, you can go to that, uh, you can access that paper. Uh, and uh, the best part about this tool is, you know, it's, it's do it yourself. Like you go there, you download the data, uh, you, sorry, you download the form, and you implement it based on your favorite you know, platform. It could be ODK, it could be, you know, uh, Kobo Toolbox or something else. It is also locally, uh, you know, you can locally adapt it based on the unit, based on the language. And we have walked all over the world uh, using ROMIS and it's been a really game changer. Uh, okay, so these are all, you know, uh, processes where the researchers are going to the field and they are collecting the data. We can also do some modern technologies, right, you know, we can do crowdsourcing. 
So this is, an, uh, uh, this is a pilot we ran uh, uh, back in 2020. Uh, we asked the farmers a very simple game, uh, a very simple guess, right? You know, guess when the rain will start. Uh, and when the farmers started uh, playing that game, what we did was we, try, we asked them simple basic questions, like where are you located, right? These are the questions that uh, Calder is also interested in their uh, national farmer database. Where are you located? Uh, you know, what kind of risk do you face? What are you producing? How much are you producing? Each time farmers are trying to take a guess, they have to answer some questions. Uh, what was the success uh, in... Uh, uh, in the uh, five weeks the uh, this game was open, we were able to get 25,000 farmers on board. We didn't spend any single dollar amount going to the field. And when we looked at, uh, when we looked at you know, uh, the total budget that was involved in the project and how many data points we collected, we saw that you know, we spent around $4 for each farmer and for each data point that we collected, uh, it was around 0 0.2, uh, you know, 20 cents, right, $0.2. And what did we learn? We learned a lot of insight. We learned that irrespective of the uh, weather, whatever the weather says, the farmers in the long run season, they always try to plant in 15th of March. They don't listen to anything. They first try to attempt 15th of March. And then when we played the game, they started to think, why, why these guys are asking? Maybe I need to change my uh, you know, responses. Like, I cannot always say 15th of March. You can see all of the guesses were coming from the 15th of March initially. Now they started thinking differently. Like, maybe I should pay attention to something else. So this actually, uh, you know, this game actually allowed us to better understand uh, what's the far farmer's perception about the changing climate behavior, right? So now what we are doing is we are uh, trying to play, you know, trying to have this game almost uh, every season for the next few years in Kenya. We are taking this to Zambia, uh, and we are also hoping to take this to Uganda in a different country, so that we can you know, kind of kickstart the farmer registration process in the digital services related to advisory. Uh, now, the farmers also, so there, this is another uh, technology that has been developed by another team within the CJIR, and the idea about you know, when you do a farm on-farm trial, the responses that you get on production is very different when you actually take the technology to the farmer's field. And when you actually involve farmer in that decision-making process, they feel very close to, uh, or they, re they have much more trust in adopting that technology. So this is basically a very simple approach. Uh, you have different technologies that you want to uh, roll out. Uh, you give three blind, recommend, blind packages to farmers. And the farmers very qualitatively at the end of the season, season says that, oh, this one performed the best or this one tastes the best. And from there, based on some you know, behavioral analysis, you come up with which technology worked where and uh, what was the you know, determining factor that helped uh, in, that helped in you know, farmer decision making. My uh, l few last slides would be on the reusability of the data, right? So we are sitting on lots of data, but how can we make it reusable? So this is one of the, you know, more of the science-facing uh, activity uh, we are doing, on the, uh, which is basically each data, our philosophy is each data should come with a script or come, come with some sort of, you know, uh, analysis framework. That will help anyone to take the data, anyone to take the script and process it. Now I'll uh, come back to it later because this is also very critical if you, have, if you are doing, dealing with sensitive data. Um, then what is the other example? Uh, we have this, uh, another project called Evidence for Resilient Agriculture. This is basically collecting, going through a lot of existing uh, you know, published literature and trying to find out from there uh, what kind of climate adaptation techniques work best where. Like, okay, we are talking about, let's say, um, you know, uh, soil conservation, right? We can talk about mulch. Now, mulching will not work everywhere. Like, you know, there is a certain condition, there is a certain, uh, you know, environmental condition, there is a certain uh, type of soil properties that, we, uh, that needs to be there for mulching to be more effective than some other places. Maybe irrigation is, uh, some places, is much more effective in something else. Like mulching might not work at all. Uh, so this, this database uh, is actually uh, helping us to better understand what kind of climate adaptation uh, you know, or climate smart technologies can work where the best. Uh, I encourage you to go to, uh, sorry, I forgot to put the link here. Uh, it's called smallholderadaptation.cgir.org. I'll 
make sure that Emmanuel has that link. Uh, basically, if you go there, we will see that how this kind of information is being used in finding out adaptation solutions across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, how does it all fit together? Okay, we talked about reusability of the data. Okay, once you have the uh, you know, reusability part figured out, it can go to a standardized format. We can talk about the data that are collected in a fair way. You know, that's, those are easy ones, right? And then it can all go to some infrastructure. You know, it could be Guardian for our case. It could be Kenyan National you know, Format Database in some case. You know, it could be Ethiopian uh, you know, AT agency in some other places. Now, that's up to the part where you have standardized data. Now we need the tools and all the analytics platform that will work on the data. And we spent most of our time in the analysis ready, in preparing analysis ready data and developing modeling tools. And from there, we can go to decision support, right? And this is where uh, we work with the farmer facing organizations. We are working with uh, Marcy Corps uh, in, for example, you know, uh, providing them their content for the Sprout platform, right? Uh, and then uh, we, uh, we are working also with you know, other private sector partners in providing them other, you know, different type of contents they might need. And what happens if you have sensitive data? We learned about FarmStack. Uh, there is also another approach that, uh, that will be released very uh, soon. It's called OpenSafely. I don't think many of us uh, have heard about OpenSafely. Uh, any, anyone, OpenSafely? So OpenSafely is basically a secure platform that was developed to deal with the sensitive data, the, farm, the patient records from the COVID uh, hospitalization records, right? And that's one of the reasons, you know, there are so many, there are multiple such protocols were developed and these were among the primary drivers where we have so much better understanding of, you know, what happens during COVID and that's why also it helped you know, in developing the vaccine. Like you could see like the, the usual vaccine development you know, cycle is 20 years, 15 years. For COVID, we got one, 1.5 years, right? And that was primarily data-driven. So we have taken that open safely approach. We have implemented that for agriculture. Uh, and this will be released pretty soon. Uh, and you know, uh, it's, it's done with the open safety team who has developed it, so we are pretty uh, you know, confident that this will work very nicely when it comes to sharing of uh, you know, sensitive data. Now, very little of this whole presentation was me. Right? Like I was presenting this groups of thousands of researchers. Uh, so uh, many of the technologies were developed under the CGI platform for big data. Now they have been taken up by uh, one CGI initiative like Excellence in Agronomy. Uh, and then, you know, all these uh, individual, uh, you know, technologies are part of different, bigger project. And I, I, I tried my best to explain some of the, uh, or describe some of the, you know, important ones that are very critical. That could be very critical when taken up to scale. They can reach, they can be, you know, they can be integrated with the, you know, mechanism that the farmer facing organizations have to reach more farmer, but not only reaching more farmer, but you know, give them the information that is backed by the science part, right? It's not only just delivering the information, but making sure that we are de delivering accurate and uh, actionable intelligence. As we think about, I really like how you how you put uh, turning data into a service. Um, and so, so as as we think about that in the broader context that we're discussing, d discussing, um, I'm wondering what do you see as the importance of data quality and data standards data policies and data, data privacy in delivering these kind of services to farmers, being able to do that at scale. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll start with the, with the first one, data quality. Uh, data, data must be of quality, but one of the things that as managers of data or stewards of data, I want to say that the, the metadata about the data about that data must be available. That's one of the most important things. I can have a very accurate data set, but I don't know the date it was collected, I don't know where it was collected, I don't know it was collected for which audience. So it is very important that we concentrate on the metadata, and as we share that data, that uh, we ensure the metadata is associated with the data sets that we share. Um, I think that was all. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. And, and 
I think it's, it's great that you're highlighting the importance of metadata so we really know about what is this data, what does it represent. Uh, and, and, and Hani, a, a similar question uh, turning to you and, and sort of from a global perspective that you come in, you were talking about different kind of systems that can be in place. Um, what, what do you see as the role of data quality, data standards, uh, data policies, and data privacy in making data useful and being able to provide good services to specific kinds of farmers and, and, and other actors? Yeah, uh, I think we touched upon some of those topics earlier, but I'll just give you another example is uh, when we go out to field or you know, when the data comes back from the field, we often see a number of data falling on the Pacific Ocean. And we don't always uh, you know, make sure that the data collection instrument that we are using uh, is actually you know, flagging those data sets, right? It's, it's, and then proning it down a little bit, when we collect the data, we also see that many of the data sets are falling within, let's say, road, because the surveyor didn't want to go to the field. Now, from the road, you can look at four different ways, right? The which field is it? One is sorghum, one is green, one is maize, and one is uh, you know, potato, right? So if I have to develop an uh, advisory, you know, we are talking about precision advisory, hyperlocal advisory, if we don't know from where this data is set is coming from, it's very difficult, right? So everything starts from the data quality, and I'm, I'm surprised, you know, like I'm often very uh, uh, frustrated, right? to see how much little effort is given to ensure that we are collecting good quality data. And when the more we are moving towards the digital platforms, the more you know we are making progress towards ensuring the quality. And the quality is tied to everything. Right? I just gave example of you know quality of the geospatial precision, right? It could be related to you know any other aspect of the data. So uh, yes that's where quality and now that links back to the data security, right? Because now you are exposing where the farmers are located exactly to the you know, meter level accuracy. So we need to have the security so that the farmers have the trust that they can share the data that uh, do any of the organizations and they are getting the value back. But at the same time, they are also confident that, that their data is not being released uh, for any you know, mal practices. Great. Thanks, Ani. And, uh, Vinay, I'm wondering if, if on this same discussion, if you have a perspective on, on opening up a bit on the policy side of things. I know the World Bank, you think it's some about policy and, and if what you've seen from working with Colorado, um, the importance of different kinds of policies and also how data then is, is shared uh, across uh, different kinds of institutions and, and governments and, and then beyond. Uh, thanks, Ewan. Just for the audience, I think Ewan has been very nice to us. He has leaked the question paper beforehand. So we are far more prepared with the questions. No, I, I think after let me confess that uh, uh, I I am I will have a very public sector bias in the lens with which I look at. And I work with the government, so I think uh, I, I naturally I have that bias. Uh, so therefore, I think when it comes to data sharing, uh, I honestly feel that uh, the public sector has a large role to play, uh, and uh, they really have to play the convening role. Uh, they really have to kind of reach out to the private sector uh, and to institutions like Agriff and not the city institutions to kind of make those connections. Uh, but having said that, and uh, I hope Irene will kind of uh, forgive me for saying this, the problem that the public sector faces is that they're so busy firefighting almost on a daily basis and the capacities are always constrained that. Uh, they really find it difficult to play that role well. And that is where, you know, when I looked at Ami's presentation, I was just talking to Daniel that, you know, something like Ami should be, uh, you know, with the CS agriculture and kind of sharing with him what are the insights. You know, because when I talk to the government, the CS agriculture, the president's office, they're really kind of wanting to see how can I get good quality data for our decision making, right? and I'll give you a simple example. The president of Kenya uh, has announced and supported that given the unprecedented rise in fertilizer prices, 150 percent increase in fertilizer prices, they are going to subsidize 6 million barrels of fertilizers in the long run. Now, the question is does government have the data to know? 
which of the small holders which is growing these, which small holder has how much acreage, what are the kind of fertilizer they use, when do they plant, where can they get them. So this is a classical example where the public sector needs to work with the private sector and CD institutions to really kind of, in a very kind of a targeted manner, in a very short time frame, come together to solve the big crisis here, which is a food crisis. So yeah, just to answer this question, I, I, you know, I, I don't think I've given a definitive answer, but I think the public sector has to play a big role, but I doubt if they have the capacity. So I think it's the responsibility of development partners, CG institutions, foundations like the Gate Foundation, AgriFit, to recognize that and reach out and provide the capacity gap and you know, work with the public sector. Yeah, great, great. Thanks, Vinay. Your partnerships is being very important there and developing the kind of structures where we can be sharing data uh, in, in different ways amongst both public and private sector there. And uh, Beza, let me, let me uh, uh, turn to you with a, a similar question, but I think uh, coming from a, a slightly different perspective, I think building on what Vinay was just saying there, that um, you're uh, implementing a, a project on FarmStack and developing this kind of approach where data sharing and interoperability is very important as, as part of this. Um, how do you see that we can encourage data sharing amongst private and public sector actors through the kind of um, <clears throat> system that, that you guys are setting up in FarmStack um, so that we can ultimately benefit smallholder farmers and others in the agri-food systems on the ground? Thank you, Ivan. So, um, different actors in the ecosystem have different uh, initiatives uh, to share data, right? So, what encourages a public sector to uh, share data versus what, what encourages private sector data might differ. But, uh, foundationally, like uh, solving the problem of uh, trust and uh, security in data sharing will be uh, common and foundational to uh, all of them, but at the same time, uh, understanding what is uh, the win for them, right? Uh, for the private sector, if they share their data, what would they get out of it? Like uh, for the research centers, like would it be validation of their data or their uh, suggestions? So understanding what is the win for each uh, different organizations in sharing uh, the data would be. Uh, something that will uh, incentivize, but solving the issue of uh, uh, control, uh, uh, assuring that whenever any partner share their data, the data will be uh, properly used uh, and having that trust and security will be any foundation. Great, thanks. And, and, and Irene, but building on that, um, uh, Vinay was mentioning how we can link between public and private sector and, and the need for that. Um, and you gave a great presentation on the Kenya Ag Observatory platform, both of you touching on that as a platform for doing this. Um, I also heard uh, partnerships as being important here. Uh, uh, Beza was mentioning that now working with Colorado on FarmStack and how <coughs> that's coming in. And so I'm wondering if you can build on this and, and, and see how you see that we can encourage data sharing through these kind of platforms. Uh, with between the public and private sector, um, and even from a public perspective, how the data policy comes in or policies come in to that to be able to foster the kind of data sharing. Uh, thank you, Dad, uh, for giving the link for the critique. Uh, however, it is quite true. I yesterday for the people in Huawei, I told them that you have to have a friend. Billy is not a development partner, he is a friend. When, when anybody, anybody works, when Masikop works into your organization, make Masikop your friend, make the World Bank your friend, learn, 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 and make sure that every day is a learning experience. Now, moving forward, I, how can you promote data sharing among us? Uh, the public and the private sector. Uh, we want people coming in and coming in, understanding their processes, understand the, the people you have in your organization, understand your capacities, understand, understand your organization first. Then you come and partner with a public institution. I also add the same for the public institution. Then we can create MOUs 
or lasting MOUs or data sharing agreements. Because when you know what you are coming for from the government, um, you understand your processes, you understand your capacities, then the government will open you the doors and you will create a lasting MOU or a lasting agreement. Thanks, Irene. Uh, I like how you said making friends is important in this. And I think, uh, I'll, I'll give a moment to this too, but just to, to be already thinking about uh, how you're building trust, I think, uh, amongst different actors and partners in, in sharing data uh, here. Um, I also heard uh, with the comments of, uh, what's in it for me with the data? Uh, and we need to be thinking about that as well as we, in, in making partner or making friends with our partners, how, how everybody sees value. Um, in, in data and, and data sharing that's there from the perspective that 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 they come from um, Ani, let me let me uh, move to you and um, see if you can build on this um, in terms of how you see partners using data in, in different ways and you you mentioned uh, uh, and not another survey I mean I think it's good another survey but we need to do it the right way and, and another app but again doing it the right way um, but how do you see uh, the partners that you're working with uh, outside of the CGIR and using data in different ways to be practical and to help uh, farmers and others on the ground? Yeah, that, that's a very difficult, and I think the response is, you know, it's a, there is no single answer to that, right? Because uh, all of us, you know, how data can help in all those partners in uh, better understanding where to target their product, how to target their product, right? You know, someone comes in with a credit product and they want to, you know, go to the market, but, you know, there is no advantage of taking that credit product to subsistence farmer or the marginal farmer because they are barely, you know, uh, uh, managing to, you know, keep the production going, right? They are not making any, any, any uh, extra investment uh, on the, but so, you know, for a data, you know, if the credit company has access to you know the data that we are talking about, different sorts of data which can create a farmer farmer's profile, then that can help them to target where to you know go, like where is the you know uh, bigger market is. Like, uh, it's kind of goes back to also for the government, right? You know, like uh, when I was mentioning, like you know, the government needs to know where the, what is the fertilizer application rate, where is the bean is growing. Uh, so, so you know the data. If there is a, this common data infrastructure, and if uh, the data is freely available among the farmers, uh, sorry, freely available among the partners, then this can help them better improve their product, right? You know, why is Amazon so successful? Because they can target you what you want to buy next. You buy one thing, they suggest you all the you know other relevant things. Why is Netflix so popular? Because you watch a thriller, they suggest you all the thrillers, right? That are of similar that have similar you know storyline or something like that. So similarly, you know, uh, if we have we can build that system uh, for the service providers that okay you know this is a, a farmer profile who has purchased credit. They might be interested in buying because they have now cash flow. They might be interested in buying you know improved variety of seed. So like this kind of infrastructure we need to build in. And there is one other component I think we often overlook is what is in there for the farmer, right? So the farmer can share the data, and you know, that for a farmer, for agriculture, the data is not one time; it's every day, it's every season, right? So you have, we have to also keep, uh, you know, encouraging farmer, keep enticing farmer to share their data, right? so, and they need to see value in addition to you know the information they are getting. Information is passive; it depends on the farmer whether they will act or not. But if they get services based on that, one example could be you know, Calro uh, doesn't go for MAU. Galro says that okay, if you want to develop a service in Nakuru, we have 100,000 farmers profile there. You give us $25,000 for getting the profile, like you know, aggregated profile, and the farmer sees a benefit of that. Right? You know, some money goes back to farmer because we have MPSA, Like almost all the farmers are connected to MPSA. The farmers see a financial benefit from there. They also see some sort of products coming to them. Right? So you know, that's also one kind of other business model that we can have. You know. Service delivery based on data across different farmers. Yeah, good, good, great point. Actually, I feel like we haven't heard yet today for the value of data and in, inherently uh, how, how, how that has value and, and how that can be used. And then the point you're getting to there, I think, is the benefit sharing 
of that. That that could go back to the farmer in some way that if they give if they give data, I know, but we use Facebook and Twitter and all this, and it's well, okay, Twitter used to be free, but at least Facebook's free. <laughs> that there's a value just from the data that's generated through using it, um, and then the benefit that, that we get is a free service there. But certainly, uh, there's a lot of value in the data that's 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 underneath that. Um, uh, Vinny, moving moving to you um, on, on a similar question. Um, and, and uh, for me, thinking about uh, the perspective that you come from, uh, from the World Bank, um, you're working across, uh, I think, every single county, or at least the 45 rural counties that you mentioned in Kenya, um, the challenges that are on the ground, um, the, the, the kinds of partners that are on the ground. And so I'm wondering, how do you see, you know, what are good examples, and how do you see data really being used by partners to address the needs of farmers on the ground? And even if you wanted to open that up a bit more into not just how do you see it being used, but also what are, what are some of the needs and opportunities for how partners could be using the data to build resilience, to improve productivity, to improve livelihoods for farmers on the ground? Thanks, Will. So I'll give two very specific examples, uh, you know, how uh, data sharing has uh, kind of really helped us, but also it's, it's, it's a glass half in kind of a story. The first example is uh, we launched, uh, uh, you know, with, with the partnership of Agri with Agri and the team, a uh, one million farmer platform in April 2019. And it was a very simple concept. We said we have these bank projects being implemented by county governments, and you have a host of these ag tech startups who really can potentially scale up, right? And a lot of these ag tech startups uh, are stuck at 5,000, 10,000 kind of numbers. So uh, the, the, the kind of farmer database, which Irene just described, described right, the geo-reference farmer data, just by opening that up and sharing that with uh, the Actic startups, we're bringing down the farmer acquisition cost of the Actic startups. So now we have uh, 27 Actic startups, which have signed MOUs with uh, 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 31 county governments, and uh, they're able to deliver services to, to the smallholders in the last one. So this is a very simple example of why, uh, how having this georeference farmer registry has helped uh, the government, uh, and we have a, played a facilitated role, but how it has helped county governments to uh, really leverage and build partnerships with active startups to solve the large cancers. The second example I, I'll give is from a development partner perspective. So I also chair the uh, the Agriculture and Rural Development Development Partners Group in Kenya. Uh, we have 23 partners, philanthropic foundations, bilaterals, multilaterals, uh, uh, investing in Kenya, uh, and they have more than 100 investments across 45 counties in Kenya. <coughs> so when we started designing a new investment from the World Bank side in, uh, in November 2021, I said, you know, the first thing we need to do is what's the depth of investment, what's the intensity of investment for all these partners across different counties. So we did that and uh, I think thankfully we, we've come up with a design and targeting where we're trying to go to those value chains and those geographies which are under invested. Right? But again, this has not been a perfect process and that, that also uh, uh, gave me a big learning as to how if we could really get this right, you know, if we could get down to the farmer level, the more good quality data, the better it is in terms of targeting and really uh, also influencing the design of development partner projects. So it was, but of course, I mean, that's why I said it's, it's a story half uh, half filled, which is like a half filled jar. Uh, but I think at least that having this database of hundred projects across thirty partners helped us, uh, you know, target a different thing. Good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I really like how you're bringing together the importance of data, and if I hear you in, in a broad sense of bringing investment in, and, and there's a session downstairs that's talking about bringing investment into this space, and so you, I think you touched on both the private sector side, which is the, the agri-tech you're mentioning in the counties and the importance of data for them to spur that agri-tech ecosystem there, while at the same time, the public sector side, you need the data to be able to see from World Bank and, and in public sector investments where those can be best targeted to have the impact on, on the ground. So um, important that we have the data so we can address the investment needs that, that, that are there. Um, Beza, let me, let me uh, move, move to you again. 
Um, and uh, come back to as we think about um, how we can foster the, this kind of ecosystem investment or uh, even uh, better kinds of apps and, and information, um, service delivery as we're saying out there. Um, again, there's this importance of the trust amongst partners and the kind of platform that, 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 that you bring. And so I'm wondering from uh, the perspective of FarmStack and other work that Digital Green has done, um, how do you see that you can build that trust among partners so that it does get shared and that we can then have the results we want in terms of better services and investment uh, being, being realized on the ground? Okay. So um, one would be like in the policy, right? What that has been discussed, right? Having the, the right kind of policy on the ground where it facilitate uh, data sharing interest. But the other would be like, uh, who would be the, the steward? Who would be the responsible organization? Who would be the center in facilitating data sharing among various stakeholders, right? So that can be, can differ from uh, country to country, but for example, for Ethiopia, the Agricultural Transformation Institute is the kind of agency uh, institute that uh, take the role of stewardship of data sharing. So private sector uh, actor or uh, NGO might not be able to trust its uh, organization to share their data, but rather can we uh, have uh, like uh, farmer profile kind of data hosted by the government and uh, uh, stewarded by them and they onboard various organizations to these kinds of platform so that they can be uh, able to uh, foster these kinds of sharing. The other would be, even if policy, data sharing policy is there, but how can technologically ensure that the data I'm sharing is properly uh, used? So from that kind of application where you have this connector kind of concept would be something that can be also implemented, right? So use case by use case level, instead of sharing my data to be one big central database, can I be able to share directly to the organization? I confidently say that they will use it for its purpose. So I'm, like having these kinds of method would definitely help in data sharing. And I'll make it worth what's in it for them uh, to be to be sharing as a part of this.